Welcome back to the Mina Kime Show featuring Lenny, the only NFL podcast where one of the hosts hears Let's Ride and panics because he thinks it means we're going to the vet. That's Lenny. I'm Mina Kimes. And on this beautiful, glorious, perfect Tuesday afternoon, I am joined by the one and only Dominique Foxworth. Dominique, uh, how you doing, man? I'm great. I know you're tired, but I also know it's a fatigue that you're happy to have because you won your Super Bowl last night. Like you, right? Uh, this was it the really one was. game if you could pick any all season to win because you're you're not anticipating like making the playoffs or making a deep no. run. This no. was it, and now you can lose the rest of them and get Bryce Young. Yeah, I said that, but then of course the, my fan brain immediately kicks in. Yeah. I'm watching Geno Smith going, you know, 15 for 16 or whatever, and and that lizard part of my brain that's starting <laughs> to fight the rational part is like maybe, <laughs> perhaps, and I hate it. I hate that about myself. Uh, um, yeah, I, I there's so much like to talk about with, with this game. So. Just to remind folks, um, Dominique and I are doing this show every Tuesday, and we're going to be recapping Monday Night Football, and then we're going to talk a little bit, or a lot actually, afterwards about some of the things we liked and didn't like from the weekend, but we're going to start with Monday Night Football. Um, I also want to say something. Um, Because we have this new show format, I I would love to hear what you guys think of it, so I haven't asked for reviews in a while, but if you can let me know how you feel about it, how you feel about the guests, let me know guests you'd like me to have, have me you'd like for me to have on on Thursdays leave it in the reviews I would love to see what you think Dominique uh everybody's starting with the 64 yard field goal yeah I feel like it's hard to start anywhere else right but it's also really boring because everybody have you found a single person on earth who thinks that was a good idea No, because um, not only was it the wrong decision to kick the field goal, they went about the kicking of the field goal in the wrong way. So, like, if you're going to kick the field goal, still preserve the time so you can potentially get the ball back. But I think we could go a slightly different direction in that let's not criticize Nathaniel Hackett for that one decision. Let's criticize him for the whole game of poopy decisions and sloppy execution and goal line fumbles out of confusion and, like, all of it. Like, you got Russ. You got talent everywhere. The defense played pretty well or very well, actually. And you end up with three trips to the red zone in the second half and three points, and it was just a mess. And then – the kicker, so if you want to not talk about the fact that they didn't choose the kick, then we can talk about how they saved all their timeouts and decided to start calling them after you wasted 50 seconds and missed the field goal, and now he's like, maybe we can get the ball back with 15 seconds left. Let's start rattling off these timeouts now. Can't take them with us. I let's okay let's focus on the Broncos side of this you know when we were talking about this team and what might derail (sighs) them or what the potential pitfalls might be um something I think like kind of came up but only tentatively and perhaps is something that we should have spent more time talking about is the fact that none of these coaches have any experience I was watching that and I was thinking that the you know offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator, th- this whole staff, of, and then with Hackett, of course, being the first time head coach, is so inexperienced. And I heard someone this morning on TV say, yeah, who, why didn't someone come up to Hackett and tell him not to do that or give him advice? And I was thinking like, well, there's no seniority there. Like there's Mike Munchak's not there anymore. There's no one there to really tell him what's what um and i think it showed not only in the final decision making in the clock management but the penalties the fact that the defense i thought though they looked played really well in the second half came out really flat in the first half um some of the offensive execution errors i kind of hate the fact that we all have to i keep i've thrown out like 20 like we and straw mans in this so i don't want to do that but that's what i'm in bristol so like i'm I'm marinating in the takes right now um but you know there's this discourse right now about whether teams should be playing in the preseason and it's silly on some ways in some levels because we just talked saw the vikings who i'm going to talk about later they didn't play in the preseason they look freaking great so i don't think it's like a league-wide thing but I did feel watching this team in particular with this coaching staff and all of the differences there and the new quarterback, like maybe they should have played in the preseason um, yeah. because, think, you know, they yeah, they just look so discombobulated. 
the issues, though, are not with players playing in the preseason. I think, that, as is the case in many problems in our lives, is we pick one variable and we're like, that's the reason why. When actuality, yeah. it's probably oh, yes. a bunch of other things that you can't control. So, like, Aaron Rodgers sucked this week because he didn't come to voluntary workouts and get the people. Like, I had to fight that fight today, this morning. Like, stop it. That's ridiculous. So, that, in this yeah. case, in this particular case, there's an order of operations, and normally teams have that sorted out. And when you are having calls that don't get in until they're late, so you're rushed and um, inevitably fumble on the goal line because of it, it seems like there is – sorry, what's that? Oh, no, no, no. I, I will say, as far as the calls go and the, the play clock ticking down, seemingly throughout the course of the game, Russell Wilson was having struggles with the play clock. That's a Russell Wilson thing. That is, a, uh, uh, you know, I was watching that from the other side in the field and being like, oh, I know this song where, um, you know, they're waiting yeah. until the very end to snap it and it really like pushing it. And at times you're very confused why um, it, that's happening. So I, I, I hear you on sort of the, the well, coaching the, side of it and all that. The, but goal yeah. line, the goal line part certainly seemed like that was not a rest thing. That felt like a play call thing. But we can put that aside and go to, like, the end-of-game decision. So every team I ever yeah. played for, we ended every practice doing two-minute drill. And the point of that was not just so the quarterback could practice calling the plays or we could practice on defense um, not huddling and getting our calls across or whatever. It was also so the coaches could practice their scenarios. And Nathaniel Hackett is the son of a coach who's been around this game long enough, and I would be willing to extend – him some bit of latitude because he's a first year head coach. I'd be willing to extend him some more latitude if something happened this in this game that never happened before. This was a run in the mill like yeah. end of game situation. Yeah, it's like it's like a rookie too. quarterback like missing on a five yard out and us being like, oh no, it's cool. It's his first game. Like, no, that's what you do. The, this the is the level like, of yeah. yeah. Sorry, I keep interrupting. I'm sorry. No, the level fine. of difficulty. The level of difficulty was not high, um, which makes me think the solution is that we don't need to have this preseason discourse about the players. We need a preseason for coaches, where we we as the audience get to watch them handle clock management and like make decisions in real time. That's what I want to watch. They need it for themselves, not just for our amusement, but for themselves to get prepared for the season because it's clear that he, like, he froze. It wasn't fight or flight. He just froze in that situation. And what made it even worse for me, and um, the same way you said we and you feel like uh, uh, ESPN, like, uh, I don't know, clone person, I kind of feel like the ex-athlete person by saying – as a player, because as a player, I found it really uncomfortable to listen to him try to double down and defend a bad decision. What I want to hear as a player in that situation is, that's on me, guys. And he doesn't have to say that to the media. Maybe he can say it to them privately. But, like, I blew that. You're out there putting your bodies on the line, giving me everything you got. I appreciate that. I blew it with the bad decision. But instead, he got up there and tried to argue that he made the right decision that is like obviously wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've all seen the numbers about Big Manis yeah. and the fact that nobody makes him. It would have been a record, obviously. I mean, um, I'm sorry. I'll cut you off back. It's not just that the numbers were there. It's also that he went about kicking the field goal in the wrong way. Like he didn't even yeah. call the timeouts before. So the timeouts were bad. actually, the timeouts were actually worse than the final decision right. in many ways. Um, how did you actually feel about Russell Wilson? So set, setting aside yeah. Hackett and, you know, everybody agrees with that. Like, what did you think of him in this offense? How did he look to you? What struck you about his play? Yeah, I thought the offense in general was, like, up and down. Russ ended up with 340, which is a lot of yards. He seemed like he didn't really have too I think there were questions about how good is he really right now. I think he's still Russell um, after watching this game. The red zone issues, they can be solved. He put that a couple of really like he threw that pass to Judy, which was a terrible throw, but yeah. Judy was incredible and made something out of it. But he threw some other like really accurate. The one in the corner of the end zone where the tight end was barely out, like he did yeah. some Russell things through the course of the game. And I was like, all right, he's fine. 
As long as they don't ruin this, he'll be okay. It's exactly what we've been saying all offseason. Like, it's going to be the Russell Wilson offense, and it was the Russell Wilson offense. Like, he looks exactly like he did in Seattle. I will say, I, I did think he was a little bit off throwing deep, including the aforementioned underthrown ball to Judy. He missed a couple of throws on go balls that he usually makes. But otherwise, I thought he looked fine. He looked accurate. Largely made good decisions. Um, the only thing that like I would be concerned about as a Broncos fan is what we saw was a continuation of something we've seen over the last couple of years, which is no mobility. I mean, yeah. he ain't moving. <laughs> I mean, Geno Smith outrushed him, which uh, I don't know if there was a, a bet for that, but I would not have placed that bet. Uh, and I think that's something that's going to probably continue, frankly, because he's, what, 33 or something, 33? Like, you know, I don't really see that him turning back the clock there. Um, but, you know, largely, like, from just to kind of wrap this up with the Broncos, like, they should have won this game. They outgained Seattle by 200 yards. They lost. They went 0 for 4 in the red zone. They had the fumbles. I don't think the defense is going to be that undisciplined again in terms of the penalties. They'll figure things out. They clearly figured things out as the game went on and, and the pressure looked better and better. So, like, I feel like this is probably the worst game they'll play, honestly, as a team, um, given the level of competition. But it was just a brutal, brutal brutal start um to quote richard sherman he's got to win this one uh <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he did, oh, can we talk about what i'm saying before we get to the seahawks about the entire legion of boom uh standing on the sidelines like that one meme of the guy at the hater at his funeral like oh, yeah. they were <laughs> yeah they don't hide it at all i no. mean I'm, doug baldwin tweeting the uh <laughs> gif like sassy cheerleader like uh, yeah the gymnast i think i forget who it's Lori. what was her name she her um anyways i don't remember gym, olympics but can you think of an example of a guy whose former teammates are so like this isn't just like i don't know yeah. greg jennings exactly. going after rogers yeah. this is a lot of players and it's pretty it's, stunning it's not a guy who's been that good and at that position, like I normally being being hated. Yeah. Yeah. Normally yeah. it's like like you mentioned, like Greg Jennings or somebody like that. And still it's they don't like galvanize around the, the quarterback or the team in that situation as much as they did around the organization. And trust me, guys don't like their teams. Like, no one really ever retires because they wanted to. No one ever gets paid as much money as they think they deserve. So for them to come out there and be like, yeah, we're on the Seahawks side. Like, they really don't like Russ. And I don't know him. Yeah, I mean. He just comes off as odd and corny, though. Like, wearing that tuxedo and just everything about him just is to his very credit. intriguing. He wore it after the game too, which takes yeah. a big man to wear to wear that outfit as your losing outfit, the uh, temptation style tux. Um, you had to fly back on the plane and that. <laughs> oh my god. Um, uh, okay, I swear I'm not coming out of the Seahawks game thinking we got some like we're gonna you know I don't think they're a playoff team, but I also think that and and this is with something like you know it's not. I guess should have been a little bit obvious for the season. They were never going to be one of the worst teams in the NFL. I saw, you know, they're and funny enough, by the way, I, I talked about this with Levitard today. All of the quote unquote terrible teams kept it close this weekend, which might be a thing. There might just not be terrible teams in the NFL this year. The Texans, the Bears, the Falcons, the Giants, like the Commanders. I think those are like when we did our team draft, I believe those were the teams taken near the bottom and they either won or looks decent and might reflect. I, I feel like this year there might it's just might be like a two tier league where there's like the, you know, the Chiefs, the Chargers, et cetera, the, the really elite teams and then kind of everybody else. And that's interesting, but and I would say that Seattle falls into that category. Um, to me, offensively, I, it wasn't f like fluky what we saw from Geno Smith. No. I mean, s s yes, thank you, because I think people were shocked. They're like, "What is happening?" It's like, no, like Geno's done this always. Like, yeah, he is an accurate quarterback. He stands tough in the pocket. Um, he can, he's got a little bit of wiggle to him. You know, he he was making a few throws on the run too. He is not a terrible quarterback by any measure, and I think you know the the fact. I don't think he's 
he's never I think what we probably saw is his best half of football play all season, honestly. Like I don't you know. But the I you know, the idea that he can't run an efficient offense, in particular, I think Shane Waldron's offense, which is really well suited to what he does, well, I think we saw that was proven wrong pretty quickly. Yeah, they're gonna be okay and uh, I mean you can have a little bit of hope. Like it's okay to have I mean the standings, they're number one. The forty ers I don't know about their quarterback. The Cardinals are like there's a number of issues with that team from the defense to the coach to the general manager to the quarterback. Like there are lots of questions there. And the Super Bowl hangover combined with the missing parts in L.A. Let's get a little hope. You guys might mess around with the division. You know you're We're thinking not, it. They're not. They're no. I'm not thinking you're with thinking the, it. Stop it. I'm the, ju- the Rams that. are fine. The, stop oh, it. I'm not thinking that. it. I will say. That. I'm not zero. zero, zero. <laughs> okay, this is gonna sound. This is gonna be the most like homerous, saltiest sounding thing I'll say, and I don't mean it this way. But I would rather that Russell Wilson was the quarterback of the Seattle Seahawks. I think he is a better quarterback than Geno Smith. That said. It was kind of enjoyable to watch a normal offense. <laughs> like, I don't know. There's just something about like, oh, the ball's coming out quickly and it's getting snapped quickly. And there's a lot of like short to intermediate routes that are suddenly available in this offense. They're using the tight ends. The special, well, he did have one like bizarrely incredible throw <laughs> across his body. But, but for the most part, you know, we know that the special explosive plays are not going to be there but the consistency was kind of nice. It was like uh, normal. I don't know. It's like I'm with you, you, you want to you yeah. want a Volkswagen and not a Lamborghini. <laughs> it's not functional week to week. I feel you. You want to get to work on time. You don't ever want to be cool. I'm like Ciara going to future to Russell Wilson, but the football <laughs> version of that. Like you know. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. I, Russell, had, Russell I had my wild future. times. <laughs> I'm ready to settle down. Oh, give me those, give me those eight yard hitches and slants, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm enjoying it. Give it to me. Um, oh man! I think yeah. Rashad Penny looked. Rashad Penny looked incredible yeah. as he left off. He looks. He is really special too. It's not just like like he his cuts and his vision, his patience, and then the explosiveness coming out of those cuts. It's all really, really good. I mean, um, in the NFC in general, not just the, not just NFC West. It's kind of weak this year. Mess around, get hot, end Stop up it. in a Super Bowl. Is it Bengals is it surprising style, to baby. you that Jamal Adams is lost for the season, but like it's not like a huge story today? No, I mean I guess uh, it it would have been a huge story if we didn't. Ha- I mean it'd have been part of the story, but you know better than I do because you follow this team more closely than than I do. But Jamal Adams was like a difference maker for a couple of games, but like he hasn't really had the positive impact on this team that I think the trade suggested that, uh, or the the amount that they traded for suggested that he, he would. Like he hasn't done things like Minka Fitzpatrick yeah. is doing uh, and the Steelers, who was also traded for a huge sum. So yeah, I, I don't know. Like he feels like he's a, his coverage skills are not, to the level that you would need him to be to be an impact player, say like a Derwin James or somewhere something something like that. Like he's a big ass, or he's a a big ass safety, a small ass linebacker, like a pass rusher kind of guy. Yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it changes what they do defensively. Um, I, Ryan Neal, I believe, is next in line to start for him. He's looked okay, um, but you know, it's this is a very inexperienced secondary, and I will say, I think that to me was probably the the biggest problem with Seattle yesterday is you just saw that on display. Uh, I mean, they, they, they were starting rookies, cornerbacks. They got a Kobe Bryant. They got a Michael Jackson back there. Would you rather be... Oh, this is actually a frock conversation. Never yeah, mind. Exactly. Uh- <laughs> and let's talk about something else. Uh-huh. Um, I think that's... You know, I, this is a pass... I actually was surprised they didn't pick on them even more. But I thought CX pass rush... You know, it was actually pretty impressive at points. Chen and Wosu, I thought, was probably the best player on the field defensively, who was their big pickup. Um, but, you know, it's not an elite unit. Like, there's, I think what we saw is there's some good players across the board, and I could see them getting better because they're young. 
Um, you know, the rookie corners are going to get better. Tariq Woolen, who's the gigantic cornerback you guys saw defending Cortland Sutton. He, he He's from UTSA. Like, it's crazy that he's even defending Kurt, Cortland Sutton and held up reasonably well. Um, but, you know, like, I... I Playing when I imagine them playing one of the, like the truly high powered passing attacks in the NFL, it, that's where the dream starts to fall apart a little bit. Well, I mean, I think the dream starts to fall apart a little bit. Um, you ask them to do it every week, but I think yeah. the Broncos, from a talent standpoint, they fit the bill of truly high powered offense. So, like, I them not getting embarrassed out there is really yeah. encouraging and positive and. They're only going to get better. Like They're going to have some bad weeks here or there. But generally, young players get better over the course of that first season and second season. So this team, I, it's promising. It's you, you're you drinking the – yeah, I, I no, you're – I was just trying to coax you in to get excited because it's so much I'm not getting fun. coaxed. <laughs> I'm, I, 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 I have held back so much. I held back going into the game. I was like, we're going to get crushed. Uh, I picked the Broncos in the Survivors League I told you about. Um, and I'm, I, my, you know, I still have pretty low expectations, but for me, success this season is exactly what you described, which is the young players looking better. Like the rookie tackles who I thought, you know, showed a lot. Obviously cross got beat a little bit at the end there against Riley Chubb who's a very good pass rusher, but like you could see a universe in which this is a football team next year that a good quarterback wants to be on. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> Man, you already disrespected Gino. You writing them off. Also, you ain't getting no letters back. Wait, let me let me toss a take to you. This is the kind of take that is perfect for you. I, I wanna I'm gonna take let's take shop this, okay? All right, let's I haven't it. this is the first time I've used this take. Okay. Right now, my big takeaway, Dominique, coming from this weekend, is that the AFC is uh not just a bloodbath now, but going to be a bloodbath forever because it has Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, and freaking Justin Herbert, who were the three like stars of the weekend from a quarterbacking perspective. And it kind of sucks, by the way, that not only are two of those teams in the same division, but that only one of them can go to the Super Bowl. If I'm Bryce Young or CJ Stroud... Mm. I pull an Eli. Yeah. I force my way to the NFC. Uh, I go to the Seahawks, I team that it. is ready for me. <laughs> I love that. I mean, I generally player power. I'm with it. I hate the draft in general. The salary caps a, is a problem. So anything that players can pull an Eli or a John Elway, there is a history of doing this. It may not work so well for Bryce for a number of reasons, but good luck. Listen. Seattle, that division is going to be winnable pretty soon. Yeah, we were just it's talking. Winnable this year, it's winnable this year. I think the Rams are better than they looked week one. I will say, I think that, that if that if I had to pick like one like kind of overreaction, I think the Bills are just so good, and I think there's a yeah. little bit of a you know we're right, uh, under recognizing the level of competition there. Okay. Um. Okay. So wrapping this up, what are your expectations now for the Broncos based on this? Uh, this doesn't change my expectations for the Broncos. Um. Same. I guess the the hope is, or the expectation is that Nathaniel Hackett and his staff figure out a better way to handle these end of game situations. So it really sucks for this to happen in their first game because this is going to be hanging over him. Like if he has anything close to a slip up, kind of like how Mike McCarthy was last year, we are going to be analyzing the hell out of your late game situations. I'd like to take shop another take. All right. How is there not like? A person out there, like, given how much money these NFL teams have, how much they spend on, I mean, freaking long snappers make a million dollars. Someone, I know that there's teams who have people who help with clock management, but what about, like, a true mercenary, a closer, who can come in and just, like, really put the coach through the paces, take them to boot camp? Like, I don't understand how this is still, even the, the, Bengals, too, there are issues with clock yeah. management at the end of that game. I'm, I just don't understand how in 2022 there are still NFL teams who struggle with this stuff. Well, the coach, the head coach is the guy who's going to be making these decisions. The head coach doesn't have a boss, and the head coach is making his time, is allocating his time to the things that he thinks are most important. And, yeah, but they don't think it's important. What they think is important is the stuff that got them this job, is designing these plays and and – like coaching the players and all that sort of stuff. I fully agree with you is 
either like give this responsibility to someone else. Like the processes aren't hard. Like lots of businesses have processes to account for much more complicated things than this. So like you should absolve yourself of that responsibility. And like if you are in that role, if I'm Nathaniel Hackett, it's like, all right, what I do is call plays, which he's never done before, but I do that now. I'm going to be prepared to call for the next down. There are three potential scenarios. I'm going to have those in my mind. I'm going to call my play. And if there's someone else who's responsible for calling timeouts and deciding clock management, then they could butt in. I got my play called. And we can have these conversations throughout the course of the game. You can go through all these scenarios ahead of time. And to me, it doesn't feel like it's that hard. I haven't done it before. It's obviously difficult. It's obviously challenging because too many like NFL coaches mess it up. But it seems so simple and so obvious. Like Peyton Manning is in the Manning cat. Well, I, I mean, I shouldn't even bring Peyton. Everybody. I was at Everybody. home like, like well, not at home in a hotel room. was like, what, screaming. What, are you, what are you doing? Really? 64? We couldn't, we couldn't even debate it on first take. <laughs> that is the litmus test for consensus in this country. Oh, gosh. Oh, All right. After the, after the break, let's take a quick break and let's come back and talk about things we liked and didn't like. All right, people, we are brought to you by Caesar Sportsbook, the greatest sports betting app of all time. See, it's not just about the daily promos, odds boosts, or the hundreds of ways to wager. It's about the immortal words of Caesar himself. You bet, you get with Caesar's Rewards. Every bet you place on the app, no matter the outcome, earns towards exclusive perks at Caesar's Rewards destinations everywhere. Hotel stays, concert tickets, bonuses, and more. Download the Caesars Sportsbook app, become a Caesars Rewards member today, and get more with every wager. Must be 21 years or older to gamble. Gambling problem? Call or text 1-800-522-4700. All right, Dominique, I don't like calling people losers. That's not true. I love calling people losers. But I don't like calling people I don't know losers. So this segment is now called Winners and Woofs. Like not not woof in a good way, but like woof in a, like a woof way. So uh, you know, woof can be woof is one of the words I think where intonation can really yeah. change. Like you can you can woof can mean so many different things. Like um, you know, uh, when you I, I don't even know how to describe this phenomenon. When you see an attractive person walking down the street, perhaps somebody might go woof. <laughs> <laughs> so who is this somebody, and why don't they go back to the nineteen fifties? It's like a cat collar, but the dog version. Woof. I don't think I've ever heard anybody do that. Woof. Woof. <laughs> Am I making you uncomfortable? Woof. All right. No, you're not. You're making me laugh. Mine is the negative one, which is woof, which is uh, not the way I typically use it. Let's start with the winners, though. Who's your winner from the weekend? Um, not the winner. A winner. A winner. Tua. Mm. Yeah. I mm. mean. It's a little interesting. This was the best possible version like it's uh, he wasn't great okay but he was good and the reason why he's a winner is because he won and he has time to improve and grow into this like the the worst scenario is him being good and them losing because no matter what the the criticism is going to come down on him right i think that's a bad outcome i don't like your face you don't you don't like you don't like my winner I don't agree with your analysis, but this isn't you're you're negging him. That's not a winner. I'm not negging him. I think that he was okay, which is a start. That he was under the most of. I mean, I guess Jalen Hurts in him are like quarterbacks under the most amount of pressure this year, and it didn't sink him. He made some really impressive throws. I was really impressed with the offense, the plays that they designed. For him, he was not perfect, but he has something to build on. Like this, to me, was an interesting game for him and a winner and encouraging going forward. It wasn't perfect, but it was a start. No, you want all no, no, out winners? I, okay, Patrick no, no, Mahomes, no, 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 no. we're done. I want to talk. I want to talk about He's the great. Dolphins because I think um, it I, to me what I saw was success for them this season would be kind of Tua basically doing what Jimmy Garoppolo did in the Niners offense, yeah. and that's what he looked like. Um, he looked like a very like accurate facilitator who largely kept the ball out of harm's way. You know, wasn't really much of a playmaker, but you don't need your quarterback to be a playmaker to a point. 
when you have playmakers all over the field and holy crap, right? Like we spent all summer talking about the speed of the Dolphins offense, but seeing it on display in real time was something else. Seeing Jalen Waddle house that slant, by the way, Mike McDaniel, real winner, going for a fourth and seven. Love that. Um, yeah. Loved, by the way, I, I, the whole game, I thought he was fantastic. I don't know how you felt, yeah. but it seemed to me like he had the Patriots defense's number, had the right call for every moment, did a great job of taking advantage of some of their coverage looks and, yeah, um, and also to some extent mitigating the pressure they were sending as well. But as far as, yeah, the, the Dolphins offense, like, they that looks like one of the best skill groups in the NFL. I, I mean – they only scored one touchdown, but I guess maybe I would modify my winner to the all the Dolphins, like the Dolphin fan base. The Dolphins are big winners this weekend. They didn't blow out uh, New England, but I thought this was let, like for a debut. This was an encouraging start. Let, let me spin zone it a little bit, too. The, I feel when I was watching, I was struck by I, I, I felt like I had not spent enough time talking about the Dolphins defense. Yeah. Because they were fantastic. Yes. Um, and I think what was amazing is they, they've got superstars. Like, obviously, Xavier Howard, you cannot throw on. Um, Javon Holland, I think, is fantastic at safety. But they also have, like, role players at every level. I was I was thinking about this. Like, Zach Sealer is, like, incredible. Their defensive yeah. tackle. He's, like, a really, really good defensive tackle. Um, Jalen Phillips making plays, you know. Um, it, it's... From top to bottom, they pretty much ran it back this year. They didn't make a ton of changes, but watching them, even you know after Brian Flores moved on, I was kind of like, oh, they didn't really need to. Like they're still really, really good. They're still really, really confusing. They, they the games that they play up front are utter chaos, and um, the Patriots were just totally, totally unprepared for even. Which was that also was shocking. If that they could be a wolf, but yeah, yeah. I, they look. Let me write. They the Dolphins are the winners to me rather than perhaps Tua, because they look like a, a playoff team. Like, I, I actually, I would say now they're firmly in my AFC wild card bracket. Yeah, after week one, I think, I, I mean, I had them there before week one, but there were some question marks that I think got answered. The expectation of the defense returning to be as good as they were last year, like, I believe that was possible, but losing Brian Flores, and generally, as anyone who listens to this podcast knows, that defenses can fluctuate. Um, a lot more than offense can from year to year. So there were still some questions around that. Seeing them come out and play the way that they did, albeit against defensive coaches coordinating the offense, against a legitimate NFL offense, they played really well, scored a touchdown, and just kind of dominated. So that is the recipe. That's the San Francisco recipe. Get a lot of playmakers, play really good defense, and say, hey, quarterback, don't blow this. And Tua didn't blow it. He seemed to know where the ball should go. He made – decisive he was decisive and anticipating and made passes he's not going to do one of those mutant things that we see uh from those other afc quarterbacks that you're talking about but that might be enough for now and this talk about locations that might be attractive for a quarterback to go that's another one that could be a, well i guess no, you would no, be no, josh no, no. allen's no, no, division no. bryce young tj I'm you're sorry. listening don't go to the Dolphins. you don't want the dolphins force your yeah. way to the seahawks yes the weather's be, much better in seattle you, you want to be in the nfc. the nfc yeah you definitely don't want to be in josh allen's division um humping people on the field it really is act. like a crazy time with like those three quarterbacks like you call them yeah. mutants like they on av- like routinely make the wildest throws, especially the next day when you could see them all from end zone view, and you're like, that doesn't make yeah. sense. Like, literally yeah. nothing about the way, the physics, the way the ball, and then they're just lost to the sands of time. We just move yeah. on. It's, like a, it's right. like a 1 p.m. game, and it'll be like Patrick Mahomes, you know, side-arming it through his legs with one hand <laughs> over his eye to, <laughs> try, yeah. to you know, right. and then we just, like, forget about it. It's yeah. such I- a weird time to be alive. I made this, um, I kind of stumbled onto this realization on my great, great podcast. Um, Check it out. Yeah, you should. Uh, That it feels like kind of like when the iPhone came out (laughs) and like, like Russell Wilson is like a Kodak camera and like uh, Dak Prescott, like these guys who... And I guess Russell's better than Dak. But in general, like, what Dak is, is, like, what everybody wanted. It's like a a stable, good quarterback. 
And like, okay, there was some, there was like one mutant in the league every now and then that could transcend. But then all these guys came in the league and they're like the iPhones. Like they do so much, so much better than these other guys that they made these players who were assets before. And like the comment before, or at least the, the, the player you're looking for, for before was like a franchise quarterback. And yeah. Dak Prescott is like the definition of a franchise quarterback. Yes, he's a franchise quarterback. These other guys, these three names that you're naming, I would throw Lamar Jackson in there also. Yep, Lamar. They are something different than franchise quarterbacks, and it's just not right for them all to be here at the same time. It just changed the league, and expectation change. And I, I'm sure it goes back to, like, how young we're coaching them and – like us, the evolution of offenses to not be only looking for like six, five guys who stand in the pocket, bringing in athletes who were like Josh Allen may not have played quarterback 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. They might have tried to turn him into a rush in or a tight end, probably more likely. So like the the league has changed so much and it, it feels like having just having a franchise quarterback is almost not enough anymore. You got to have one of these these mutant iPhones. I would be so frustrated if I was the, I don't know, Nokia in your, <laughs> like the flip phone. Who's, who's the yeah. most flip phony quarterback in the NFL? <sighs> who's like true neutral? <laughs> it's Kirk Cousins, right? It's always Kirk Cousins. Uh, Kirk yeah, Cousins, like, yeah the... right. He's like good. He plays on time. Yeah. He's accurate. He's mechanically sound, but he ain't going to create like these guys. Like he's not going to like. Is, what is Carson Wentz? Like, because Carson Wentz has the ability to be the iPhone every now and then, but he also is like a rotary phone from time to time. It's just he's just like a phone. You got an iPhone, but you didn't want to spring for the good provider. You like getting a cheap provider. Like yeah, he's yeah. got all the tools, every, but yeah. every now and then the call comes through cl- crystal clear. But then half the time, you're like <laughs> drop. He's holding it up to the sky. <laughs> um, okay, well, you mentioned Kirk Cousins, so that's a segue to my winner. Uh, this is, I feel like other than the freak quarterbacks, the mutants, as you called them, um, Justin Jefferson is the winner of the weekend uh, <sighs> because he just looks simply uncoverable. And, th- you know, it's not surprising. He was awesome last year. I think before we even saw what the scheme looked like, there was the assumption that in the Cooper Cup role, Cooper Cup role, um, he would be awesome given that, you know, he was so good in the slide at LSU and that he's so complete. He's really like, I I think part of the reason why there's been talk about him for some time as being potentially the best wide receiver in the NFL, even with cup and Adams is that he can literally do everything. I think Adams can do everything too, but the length, the speed, the, you know, just contested catch ability yards after the catch, the route running his like the ability to use leverage, his releases, it's all there. Yeah. He's the total package. And then, um, you know, to see it on display, to see how good Kevin O'Connell was at getting him open, moving him around, the motion, the stacks, the, he, the way he was hiding him, getting all the matchups he wanted. I, as a defensive coordinator, that, it's, a, it's a nightmare, like, watching that. And it was interesting to watch from the broadcast angle at first because he he's now one of those broadcasts, those players who are on broadcast, you just don't know what the hell's going on because you're like yeah. – all of a sudden, he's just there's like not a guy around him for ten yards, mm-hmm. and again, when you don't see what's happening and the route he's running, it's just so immensely frustrating. Probably if you're rooting for the other team, but I feel like that's going to be the situation all season long. Yeah, you nailed it. I was really coming in here ready to break it all down and explain to you why Justin Jefferson was so wide open, and it wasn't because um, the Packers didn't know he was good or the Packers were bad or stupid or their players or whatever. Like the play design was ingenious from Kevin O'Connell and to be able to like, they were in a cover four a lot. And so when you see the highlights, you like see a linebacker trying to tackle him. You're like, what the hell are they doing? They got a linebacker Mm -hmm. covering them. Or you see a safety trying to run with him. Like, damn, they're dumb. He just had a big play. And now they got a, they got Savage or Amos trying to run with him. But no, when you rewatch the film, you can see the motions and stack like they're in cover four. They find ways to put him in position to force you to either like corrupt your coverage or he has to be guarded by a linebacker. And yeah. or you just have to stop running. You have to run man all game and just lock Alexander on him or something, which then exposes everyone else who's not comfortable with playing man all game. Like he Yeah. There there are guys who and you and I talk about this a lot, is like what you need to be good 
uh, on offense or defense in general is like you need one thing that you can rely on, be it a, a play or a player, and then everything builds off of that. So that's Justin Jefferson. He's so good that you're going to have to contort yourself to stop him. And if you do stop him, everything else is breaking down. How many times when they were in quarters did Kirk Cousins just target him in the flat and he was able to pick up an additional five plus yards because of his speed and his ability to modulate his speed? It's yep. it's a nightmare. There were times I will say where the Packers zone did not look sound. I think one of them was maybe it was like the deep over where they were yep, playing. I know exactly what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, and I was like, what the hell's going on here? Yeah, <laughs> somebody, was... somebody, somebody done messed up. But um, I want to go back to what you just mentioned, which is the issue of man. Because coming out of this game, I think there was uh, a lot of people had questions. Okay, you have Jair Alexander, who's one of the best cornerbacks in the NFL, who can play man and zone equally well. Right. Um, why don't you just man him up? And afterwards, I think it was uh, Matt LaFleur, not Joe Barry. One of them was like, well, then, as you p- pointed out, well, we just can't, you know, we, we're one, we're his own defense, but two, like everyone else can't just play man all game long. And um, I, I was wondering, like going forward, if you're a defense watching this and a defense that has a number one cornerback, like for example, Los Angeles. I don't know if they're playing, but I think that's a really good analogy. Uh, uh, or it's a similar defense that plays a ton of zone and has a cornerback in Jalen Ramsey, who we would probably put in that same tier. How would you approach this matchup? Well, Jalen Ramsey uh, plays everywhere. Yeah. So you can lock Jalen Ramsey and still play zone. Because if you motion Jeff, Justin Jefferson, so Jalen's at the corner spot. Assume Justin's outside at the corner also. Jalen's there, and he's playing quarters. If you motion him down, Jalen can go with and then become the nickel. Assuming you're a nickel, then the nickel can become the corner. Or Jalen can motion down and become the safety, and the safety drop down to be the nickel or the linebacker. So the it's possible with a player like that. But again, what you're doing there – is you're having to adjust four players. Right. What you do. Based off of one Your motion. whole identity. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, like, you can do that once. It might work. If they motion ten times in the game, I guarantee you two or three of those times, somebody's going to blow it. And that's the point of, of having right. a player like this. There's, you know, and, and if they blow it and Kirk Cousins hits it, that's six points. And that's all you need. And the Vikings have Adam Thielen and KJ Osborne, who are exactly. very good wide receivers. Who, by the way, I tweeted this, were on the field the whole time. Which is a very Rams thing to do also, is to have your same three wide receivers play every down so you can go up tempo, so you don't have to substitute them, uh, because they can do everything. And it, it, Yeah, it's, it's going to be a freaking problem, man. It's going to be yeah. a problem. Alright, let's get through these woofs pretty quickly. I'll go first. I'm taping this from Bristol, Connecticut, so I'm actually contractually obligated. I haven't hit my quota of Cowboys talk today. Uh, hopefully this accomplishes that. Um, my woof is Jerry and Stephen Jones. Yeah. It's not Dak Prescott. It's not the Cowboys. It's not even Mike McCarthy. All of those aspects of the team were bad as well. I, you know, Dak had a bad game before he got hurt. Just skill players, whatever. But I was just struck by how ill-prepared this team was from a roster standpoint for this season with the skill players that they had. And then the fact that they didn't have a better backup quarterback than Cooper Rush, who frankly is, I would say, maybe famous last words, this can be come back to bite me if he like goes on a roll, but I don't think he's good. I think he is a bottom 10 back backup quarterback in this league. Um, he's extremely bad when pressured, by the way. I, people are like, well, I beat the Vikings last year. Over the course of his career, when Cooper Cup is pressured, do you know what his QBR is? Cooper Rush. Cooper Rush. I keep saying Probably Cooper like um, one. It's five. So <laughs> it's close. Um, yeah, he ta- he joking. gets he gets sacked at an extraordinarily high rate. When he's pressured, he's sacked 30% of the time. Dominic, I don't know if you've been noticing, um, but the Cowboys offensive line, it's not a strength anymore. So yeah. I just don't see this working out. But but more importantly, like I don't there's nothing they can do. Like I people have been saying, Oh, they should go get this guy, this guy. No, they there's none of the good teams are gonna trade them their backup quarterbacks, like uh-huh. I don't know, a Baltimore with a Tyler Huntley. Yeah. And Dallas now, if Dak is back out for just four or five games or whatever they're not going to make a dumb trade this is something they should have addressed in the offseason and they didn't like so many other things they were the worst offense in the league by um epa this week one 
<laughs> Talk about bad. That is really bad. And you can't blame one person. And then you compound it by having Jerry Jones presumably rushing Dak Prescott back oh, from yeah. injury, oh, which yeah. is like, talk about Wolf. That is just, I, I, didn't I don't that. know if he knows something about medicine that none of us know. They got some special um, elixir down there. But six to eight weeks is six to eight weeks. Just because you want him back doesn't mean that he's going to be back. And it could prolong it, make things worse. And what it's not going to do is, like, improve you guys' chances this season. It just seems like almost a blessing in disguise to have Dak hurt. Just go ahead and ride this out the best you can and start rebuilding and setting for next year uh, while um, getting more experience to other guys. Rushing Dak back, I think, is the absolute worst thing that they could do. Could not agree more. And yeah, I mean, we were talking about a quarterback at the beginning of this podcast who was rushed back from injury or rushed himself back. I don't know, but it was ugly and it was a mistake. Um, Russell they were worse. Back, so. They were worse than the 49ers who played in a bowl of soup. Like by EPA, they're negative 17. The 49ers crazy, and the Rams were both negative 12. And yes. that is incredibly bad. Whew. All right, who's your wolf? Um, my wolf was Nathaniel Hackett, but we did that already, so we can go with the Falcons for choking it away. That's pretty wolfy. It was fun, though. Exciting. Do you come out of that with any, like, I know they choked it, but, like, do you come out of that with any enthusiasm for the Falcons? Yeah. I mean, it was encouraging. Um, Arthur Smith storming out was funny, but it was encouraging because they had hold of this game and they had interesting and fun offense, which – yeah, is nice. They have a lot of talent on that, or playmakers at least on that side yeah. of the ball. But I, um, I don't think anyone was expecting them to be competitive in that. But then once they had it in hand, like them and uh, the Texans also just kind of squandered an opportunity, which was embarrassing. But yeah, the Colts could fall into the wolf category. Uh, that's a big wolf for me. Yeah, yeah I thought as far they as were like good. biggest letdowns. Yeah, and um, Matt Ryan's one of your guys. Like, I feel like... I'm giving him another week before I address <laughs> what we saw from Matt Ryan. Giving it another uh, week. Um was bad. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just like a lot of, I think, the Niners being a letdown, uh, clearly. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I can explain away the Niners let down. There, right. there is certainly a lot to be concerned about there Weird. with Trey Lance's decision-making, but... They were playing in conditions that they will never, ever play it in again. Awesome. Well, like here's here's my big concern about the Niners. I'm about to talk about this on NFL Live. I didn't. I don't think Trey Lance played well. I thought Justin Fields looked a lot better than him. But the Niners' offensive line stinks. I was shocked. <laughs> Uh, and that's not something that is about the conditions. Like they, uh-huh. I, we talked a lot about the center. And, you know, Jake Brendel, his name is, right? And, you know, moving on from Alex Mack and whatnot. But, like, I thought outside of Trent Williams from the, the left guard on, this is not a good group anymore. I don't know yeah. when that happened. Like, it, it, it was happened like, fast. <laughs> happened real fast. And, like, it's yeah. going to be a real problem for Lance, who we know holds on to the football a long time. Um,. And if they can't, with Elijah Mitchell's now, if they can't execute any of the stuff with him in the run game, like the design, design run game either, it's going to really constrict what they do on offense because so much of that offense is dependent on you know having that sort of multiplicity. Yeah, I thought they were good on the offensive line, to be completely honest with you, and maybe I just was getting hung up on looking in this at game? Williams only. No, 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 no. Oh, you meant coming into this, this yeah, 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 Coming yeah, yeah, into yeah, this yeah, season, yeah. I, I yeah. consider their offensive line um, – Not a weakness, maybe not a strength, but not a weakness. But maybe I was just thinking about Trent Williams going in motion and plowing through people in playoff games. But, yeah, they... They made the Bears defensive. Like, Demarcus Robinson, I think his name is. I forget. He was absolutely toasting uh, McGlinchey in the right side. I don't know. So, yeah. Um, The Bears, man. Bears. My Bears. Love them. Your Bears. Your Bears. They, They had a week one Super Bowl, too. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> let's keep it real bears fan y'all, oh, y'all no no that. not on this podcast i'm not uh, trying okay. to anger them you, you can anger right. bears fans yeah, on your own podcast. come on over to my podcast if you want to get mad <laughs> um all right thank or you if dominique you get honest i'm sorry we'll be back next week like i said let us know in the reviews what how you feeling about the new format what kind of stuff you want um but this has been fun awesome
Let's ride.